Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Steps to growing our faith. We look at Hebrews chapter 11. It, we call that the, the hall of faith. You'll see people's names mentioned, uh, people that we, we've heard of that are well known. And there'll be some that we may not have known about or studied about or not know much about, but they all have something specific for us to learn that this way, God took notice of each one of these people, even the person who made a promise. He said, if anyone comes in that, the first one that comes in this door, I will sacrifice that particular person. It happened to be his daughter. His name was Jephthah. So in this hall of faith, you've got all kinds of different types of people, all kinds of lessons to learn because Life is full of examples of what, what to do and what not to do. And so Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 6 says this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it, faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For, behold his, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that seek him. Last week, we ended talking about Cain and Abel. And we talked about the aspect of Adam taught Cain and Abel what they were supposed to do. Now, Hebrews chapter, or Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Both of them were taught... Cain did not listen, Abel did. We know the story where, in fact, let's go to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Verses 2 and following says this, And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first things of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth, wroth and why is thy countenance falling? If thou doest well, shalt not thou be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. See, the God wanted Abel to, to understand that, yes, he may have made a mistake the first time. When it talks about sin lieth at the door, a sin offering, God had prepared a sin offering, which was a lamb that was at the door, before he was to sacrifice and he chose not to accept the, the gift that God was giving to him. Sometimes people have in their mind that they can do it their way. And God gives chance after chance after chance. And because we get all these chances and we mess up, then guess what? There's a consequence for that. And the consequence for Cain was that he was going to be a vagabond. And another consequence, because he got mad, he became vengeful. And because he became vengeful, then he became angry, and, and he ended up committing murder. And then after he committed murder, God confronted him. In fact, let's see where it says right here. Um, verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? Now, did God know where Abel was? Yes, he did. And we're going to know, we're going to see why, where he found out where he's at. But the fact is this, is that Cain was confronted by God, where's your brother? 
And he said, I know not. Wrong words. I know not. And here, here's where when people get are guilty, they always look for a way to, to throw that, that blame off. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, how would I know? I'm not his babysitter. Although I'm older than him, I want you to know that it's not my job to take care of that spoiled little brat called Abel. And the Lord said unto Cain, verse 10, and he said, what hast thou done? Another question. That was, that's a quick, that's the thing is that the Lord will ask these questions, not because he doesn't know, but he's trying to test our character and test who, if we're willing to trust and believe who God is. What hast thou done? Here it is, the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. The aspect of innocent blood. And now thou art, art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto her, thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And this is what Cain says, and Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. I can't handle the consequences. We should have thought about it beforehand. He had the chance. The sin offering was there. All he did was pick it up and sacrifice the animal. But he chose not to. Then he chose to lie to God, blame shift, throw off the, 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 the blame from himself. Am I my brother's keeper? I don't know where that boy is at. I can't keep up with him. And, and God says, the voice of your brother's blood crieth unto me. Innocent blood. God despises the murder of innocence. Just think about all those children that have been aborted. Murdered. The voice of them crying out for revenge. The fact is that God does not like the aspect of murder. And so we see this aspect of, of Abel obeying God. And because he obeyed God, he was taught the right thing. Cain was taught the right thing, but he chose to do his own thing, which tells us that, once again, the volition of will was given to Abel, I mean, to, to Adam. He chose to make a bad choice. Now you have a generational decision where daddy makes a bad decision, and now the son follows up and makes another bad decision. Are there generational curses out there? Yes, there are. I know that back in the 90s, after all three of us, me and my sisters got, had been married for a little while, that um, I was down in Florida, and um, we had all, my, Lucinda and my two brothers-in-law and my two sisters, and we all got together, and we made a pact and said, every one of our families, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, have ended, their marriages have ended in divorce. Let's make a pact that that stops here and now that we will follow through until death do us part. That was 30 years ago. We tried to break and we broke that generational curse. The fact that we had made a decision that we're not gonna let that to go any further. And as believers, that there's an aspect of that we're gonna have to learn what has been in our generations of the past and break those things. You analyze your family's history and things like that and that doesn't match up with God. Um, one of the aspects on my stepfather's side was alcohol. I mean, all the, the friar men were alcoholics. Well, that got broke. Not gonna do it. Why, am I any better than anybody else? No, it's a matter of choice. It's a matter of choice. And so Abel made a choice to obey God. 
Cain made a choice to do what he wanted to do. And did not Adam blame shift when he was confronted by God after he, well, we're naked. Why are you naked? And what happened with the consequences? Those consequences continued throughout their generation. And since that generational curse started with Adam and Eve, and they're the father and mother of the world, guess what? It's continued through generation. But you got to make a choice. You got, And our faith is what's going to guide us to make the right decisions. I will tell you that there's an awful lot of pressure to follow along family lines. If I would have listened to my parents at the age of 18, I would have gotten married to a 17-year-old girl. Would not have worked out very well because I went to college, she was finished her senior year, and then she went kablooey and I went a different way. We could have had a mess. But I told her and I told her, I told my family, I'm not ready for this. I want to make sure this is the right thing. I'm going to serve God. If it be the right thing, when I finish up college, then we'll pursue that. Well, God took care of all that. Or she made that choice. And I made that choice to go a different way. The aspect of faith. What did, uh, what did faith teach Abel? Look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, and it says this. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. The blessing of the sacrifice was the shedding of the blood of the lamb. Why is it significant? Multiple generations later, guess who it became the, the sacrifice? The lamb of God. And every one of those times those, those lambs were sacrificed, it was a picture of what was to come, the shedding of blood. And thank God that that blood that was shed is, is everlasting blood. And it's not been stained by sin or cursed by the law. And that same blood that is able to forgive people is able to help us along life's pathway. So faith taught Abel that he needed the shedding of blood. Now, <clears throat> of what does Abel's act of faith still testify? That God's instructions are always correct. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 7 says this, Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Leaven in, in the Bible is a picture of sin. Purge it out, that you may be a new lump, as you're unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The aspect of God's instructions are correct. Now, now let's look at Genesis chapter 5. We're going to look at the seventh man from Adam. The seventh man from Adam. Is numerology important? Can it be used in the Bible as we study the Bible? Yes. And so we're going to see, what's the, does anybody know what the number seven in, in biblical numerology mean? Perfection. Number of perfection. Like seven days. Genesis chapter 5. Verse 21. We see a man named Enoch. And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. Now notice this next verse. For 65 years, Enoch lived his life as a father, uh, as, as a man. Um, but then something changed. He had a baby named Enoch or, or Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and he begat sons and daughters. So for 65 years, he did his own thing. All of a sudden, he has a baby named Methuselah and then he starts walking with God. The significance of understanding, now look at how old he was 
all the days of Enoch. 365. What's that significant? It's a day of the year. So Enoch walked with God every day of his life. 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God talk, took him. Basically, God met him in the morning and said, Enoch, let's go for a walk. He went with the walk, and he's still walking with God because there's no night. 365 years, Methuselah lived, and all the days of Enoch was 365 years. The number of seven, he's the seventh man from Adam. And the aspect of 365. It's a picture of, of what God can do. The aspect of it's amazing what a child can do to a person's life. Now you say, well, what did Enoch talk about? We have a little idea what he talked about. Look at the book of Jude, Jude verses 14 through 16. Now, this is near the beginning of life. Jude 14 through 16 says this. Jude 14 through 16 says this. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. He was prophesying the Lord's return. He didn't have the Bible. He didn't have church. He didn't have Bible studies. He didn't have preachers. But he's proclaiming the aspect of Jesus was going to come back again to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. I just noticed that. How many times did that word ungodly come into? One, two, three, four, right? Ungodly, ungodly, two, three, four. And this, now look at verse 16. This is the aspect of who the ungodly are. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and the mouth speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. This is the beginning of time. Does that not sound like society today? But beloved, remember you the words that were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you there would be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. Five times, the number five in the scriptures is the aspect of grace. Although they're ungodly, God is still able to forgive them if they're willing to change. Five times, and we're talking about societal issues here. We're talking about murmurers. Those are the folks that, that talk and, com and complaining, complaining, walking after their own lust, basically doing what they want, when they want, how they want. And they're not speaking great swelling words. I mean, they were... They use the word pontificating now, which is a big fancy word, which would basically, look at me, I can use these fancy words and I can throw them around like I'm educated, I'm smart, and I can do everything I want to do because I can, I can confuse you with the use of my ability to speak. It sounds like a lot of people today. Having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Basically, manipulation of people to get what they want. Is that not society today? That was in Enoch's day. So, which tells us the flesh hasn't changed one bit from Enoch's day or pre-Enoch's day to this day. It hasn't changed one bit. 
When you look at the last days and all the aspects of what the Bible talks about the last day, you'll find these characteristics plus other ones in the scriptures. But how do we grow? We learn from it. Is that Enoch's faith pleased God. And the testimony of God concerning Enoch, look at, go back to Genesis chapter 5, verse 22 and 24. Here's his testimony. Verse 22 says this. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And verse 24 says this. And Enoch walked with God. He walked with God. It says twice he walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. One day God's going to take us. I don't think we have much more time left. With all the stuff that's happening around this world, I think we're really, really close. Things that we may not know about when it comes to the politicians and things like that, what's happening in the Middle East right now, all those different things. Boy, we are really, we are really getting to the point where this one world government, this one world leader is going to come in because it just seems like every year turn around, there's wars and rumors of wars. And, and you're talking about the possibility of collapse of financial systems and different aspects about society. Have you ever thought, did you ever think you, you would see in our society today how bad it is getting around this country? It's bad. It it's really is bad. And when you think about, even in the, in the state of Kansas, the number two city in the state of Kansas when it comes to the most amount of robberies and things like that, it's 30 miles away from Pittsburgh, Kansas right now. It's in Parsons. 30 miles away, the worst town when it comes to crime and the whole, that's even including Kansas City. Parsons. Good old Kansas. Good old middle of the country. Just, um, just we're just old country folks out here. But it doesn't matter if country folks or city folks, the Adamic nature is still there. Now, I don't say that as a, as a slam against the community because I've got a lot of friends over there and I, and I love going over there because I enjoy being over there. What I'm telling you is that society today is not getting any better, it's getting worse. And yet, Enoch preached very hard, a very hard message, and while he was doing that, he was walking with God. Can you imagine the fact of Methuselah? Only thing he knew that his father was, was a preacher of righteousness. That's all he knew his daddy was. He was, a, he was a preacher that preached righteousness. And because he walked with righteousness and preached righteousness, God said, come for a little walk, we're going to enjoy ourselves. One day he, God's going to say, let's take a walk ourselves. And then we're going to be translated. You think about translation, you think about, if you were to think about just something that we can apply, it would be basically when you talk about different languages, you get people from different cultures, they speak different things. You have to have someone to be able to take what relates with that culture and be able to cause what the other culture is and be able to cause other people to understand it. So when Enoch was translated, he had been walking with God. God says, let me give you a different view of walking with me. I'm translating you from your world. It's the eternal. In fact, I believe it was what? It was, was it yesterday? Was the anniversary of, of uh, Everett's passing away? The uh, 7th of May? Okay, I had something come up on my Facebook, and wow. I'd mentioned I'd mentioned about uh, Everett passing it away. The tenth year, but it was the seventh. Day. The seventh, yes, and it just brought back just memories. The translation, the people that we know of that have gone on to be with the Lord. God says, "Hey, let me take you from here. Let me translate you." 
Let me take you from that broken condition of, 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 of life and let me give you a different view of life from my point of view. And when you think about the hurt and the problems and the health issues and, and, and different things like that and how it breaks the body down and destroys the body, God says, let me give you a different point of what happens when you're walking with me in a different world. I give you a new body that you can understand what it's like to be free. I'm going to let you be free from all the shackles of the world. And I'm going to give you a chance to be understand what it's like to be with me forever. Translation. He was, he was changed from this world to a much better place. That, and that's what we look forward to. We look forward to be able to, to leave this old world and from this world that we're going to go to a much better place. Thank God for that. And as the world continues to just spin out of control and, and just falling apart, I know as a believer that God has something much better for us. That we don't even understand what God has for us. I have not seen or heard the things that God had prepared for those that love him. What a beautiful day that's going to be when this whole world is, we are left this world, we're translated from this whole world into an eternal world with Jesus Christ forever. And to see what he's done with everyone else that's trusted him from all over the world. What a beautiful sight that's going to be. Just, just to hear our brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world. We're not going to worry about skin color. We're not going to worry about culture. What, because we're all shed. We accepted Christ by his shed blood. It doesn't matter. We get to heaven. That's the translation. But he had this reputation that he pleased God. So let's look at some verse regarding pleasing God. Look at 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter three. Look at verse 22. Pleasing God. Is it difficult to please God? No. We'll find out what it, what it does to please God. Verse 22 says this. A first John chapter three. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13 says this, verse 16. But to do good and communicate. Say communicate, we're talking about talking, no. We're talking about giving. But to do good and to give, forget not. For with such sacrifices, look what it says, God is well pleased. To do good and to give, forget not. With such sacrifice, God is well pleased. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse 4. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says this. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, God has given us the trust of the word of God. We've been allowed of God as a trust. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. Not pleasing men, because if you preach the word of God, someone's going to get upset. They're going to get offended when you preach the whole counsel of God. People like to hear about love and kindness and grace, but they don't like to hear about the other aspects about sin and disobedience and consequences. 
not as pleasing men, but God. We have been given a trust by God to preach the word of God and proclaim it, and God is pleased with that. Look at Proverbs chapter 16, Proverbs chapter 16. <clears throat> look at verse 3, and then we're going to look at verse 7. Verse 3 says, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Look at verse 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh his enemies to be at peace with him. What does that mean? It means that when we are pleasing God, then God silences the enemy. So there's all kinds of turmoil and stress and things like that. You may want to say, is there anything in my life that's not clear? I've got to get that thing taken care of. Because I want to please the Lord. I want to hear the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't know of any kid that likes to see mom and or dad mad. And you know, we always could tell when mom or dad are mad. Didn't have to say a word, you could just tell. With the look, with the, the, the sensations that were coming out of there, or the ver their verbiage, their voice tones, you knew that things were not going to be happy in, in Happyville. And so when you look at the aspect that when the Bible says that when a man's ways please the Lord, that our enemies are at peace with, he, with us. So the aspect of we got to please the Lord, find out what makes him happy and just do it. What does God, he wants, he wants us to live the right type of life. He wants to honor, he wants us to honor him. He wants us to give. He wants us to um, honor people. He wants us to do the right thing. And because of that, he will, he will cause our enemies to be at peace with us. I know that when in my life, that when I start noticing that things are, there's a lot of turbulence going on, I stop and say, okay, Lord, what is in my life that may not be what you want to be and show me so I can get this thing taken care of because I like peace. I don't like turbulence. I don't like stormy type stuff. I, I enjoy the peace and quiet. And so without faith, it is impossible to please him. If we do good and give sacrificially, it pleases him. Walking in his steps pleases him. And so when you look at Enoch, Enoch walked with God and he pleased him enough that God says, let's go for a walk. Now, once again, he didn't have televisions, didn't have internet, didn't have any type of connections, uh, didn't have a local church to go to. He does that, him and God. And he developed that relationship with him and God. What a unique situation of a man named Enoch who had some generational things to deal with, and he walked with God. And when he had his child, Methuselah, I want to make sure my child knows that I'm going to do the right thing. I want my child to see nothing but the best part of life. I want my child to know what it's like to serve God. And we know that Methuselah was the, was the oldest man on the earth. He, he lived for... 969 years. That's a long time. <laughs> I get tired at 62. I can't imagine 969 years. <laughs> and sometimes it gets very wearisome to be able to just do the right thing, isn't it? It's tough. It's a struggle. But for 300 years, his son knew, hey, this is the right way to do things because we're going to please God. I think about one more person. We won't talk, we won't talk about him, but I think about a man named Job. Job performed sacrifices for his kids. 
because he wanted to make sure that God was pleased with his, pleased with his kids. He loved his children enough to make sure that God was going to be pleased, not with just his life, but with his kids' lives also. It takes extra work. That takes love and devotion, but it's worth it in the end. We serve a big God, don't we? A big God. Okay, let's, let's take up some prayer requests. Next week, we'll talk about...